This is April the 19th, 2001, and we're here today with Margie Licklider. This is April the 19th, 2001, and we're here today with Margie Licklider. Could you say your name, ma'am? <coughs> I'm Margie Licklider, and I worked at Aftex for 49 years. Um, I graduated from Edinburgh High School in June 1940. On December the 9th, 1940, I got my job at the American Viscose plant in Front Royal in the Coning Room. We worked five and a half days a week and my first pay was $11 a week. That was big money for me as I had been working that summer on odd jobs for 10 cents a day, including working in the cornfields. In six weeks, my pay went to $16 per week. I learned the job very quickly, and I remember one day my boss, Mr. Baker, said to me, I just wish I could hire 15 girls that could work like you do, Margie. Well, that gave me the idea that I wanted to really, really be a good worker. <clears throat> I was 18 years old and a plain old country girl. I liked my job and I gave it my all. I had to pay 25 cents a day to ride with some of the other workers from Fort Valley. At that time, gas was five gallons for a dollar. During the war, when gas and tires were rationed, we had flat tires quite often, and sometimes we ran out of gas, as both were hard to get. One of my fondest memories was buying my younger sister a dress and a pair of shoes for a school program she was in from my first pay at American Viscose. The dress cost 99 cents and the shoes cost 89 cents at Newberry's. My father had died and left my mother with nine children and I was working very hard to help her try to raise the younger children as there was no social service or no help at all at that time. After working several years, we went on piecework. That's when I made the most money. You were required to do a certain amount each day, and I liked the job and needed the money as I was helping my mother. I liked my job, and I was very fast. When we were making rain for the government during the war, we worked lots of overtime. We got time and a half for that, or on holidays, we got double time and a half. I remember when the first African-American girls came to work in the coning room. They were Teresa Mason and Ann Baltimore. Teresa from Winchester and Ann was from Front Royal. They both learned the job very quickly and were excellent workers. At first, some of the workers were not too friendly toward Ann and Teresa, but soon everything was fine. More and more African Americans came to work and all went well. When things would slow down at the plant, we would share time so none of the younger workers would be laid off. I remember some of the deep snows and some of the roads were closed and we couldn't get home. The deepest one I remember was in 1962. They let us sleep on the benches in the locker room and some of them slept in the dispensary. And we were working 3.30 to 12, so when daylight came, they told us, they gave us our breakfast and told us that we could work daylight and by evening the roads were open, we could go home. <clears throat> a lots and lots of the uh, girls and boys fell in love at the plant. And they were married and are still together. 
I think it was a wonderful place to work, and you could make good money. The bosses were very good to you. I worked in the coning room for 40 years. And when the coning room closed in 1980, I was transferred to the twisting department and worked there for nine years. I'm 79 years old now, and I feel that I could still do the job. To me, it was an easy job, and all my bosses treated me with respect and kindness. This was a big part of my life that I really enjoyed and looked forward to going to work. The three people that have the most years of employment since American Vist Coast opened, then FMC, then it went to Avtex, are myself, Thomas Hammock, and Paige Savell, all started working in the coning room. When the plant closed down October 1989, my son, Terry Licklider, was working in the powerhouse. I am glad to have worked at the plant and met so many fellow workers. It makes me very sad to read the obituaries and see where another of my fellow worker has died. I will always be thankful to Mr. Adam Frisky, Bill Wood, and Paul Oat, and others, many others, for all the kindness they showed me while working for them. And uh, at, while working at Avtex, they would give you a gift for years of service. I have uh, two pins. Uh, one is an emerald, has an emerald stone, and one is a diamond. I have a gold watch. I have a clock like you wind up and it strikes. And after 25 years of service, you got five weeks vacation. But I think uh, you got four weeks when you got 20 years of service. And while we were working, we had two rest periods during the day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So I think that it was a wonderful place to work. I enjoyed all the years there. And when I had my children, three girls and one boy, as they grew up, they would really help me at home so that I could work. And I don't know anything else to say. Now, when you first started working, you, was it the coding room? Yes. The coning How group. many years were you in the coning room? Forty years. Forty years. And then when the coning room ended, you went to the twisting. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about what work you did in the coning room, what the what the actual um, labor was, and how that fit into the rail process? The um, they brought cakes of yarn, they called them cakes of yarn, into the coning room and we had to uh, put them on the machines and make large cones out of them. And that was shipped away. They um, shipped those away. Now Ruby Chat told me that uh, she was amazed that um, you were making even more than your foreman at one point because your production was the highest in the counting room. And you actually did an extra step. When you tied your threads together, you cut them. And she said nobody could figure out how you could be the highest production person and even have an extra step. Could you talk a little bit about how you were so, so fast in your job? Well, I don't know. I could just use my hands fast. When we had to take a test out at the office when we got our job, and they gave you a test on how well you could use your fingers and how fast, I remember telling them telling me that I made 99. So I don't know why I could use my hands that fast. 
But you had to cut that knot. It had to be perfectly straight and tied real tight because the company they sent it to would send it back if it wasn't correct. Now, could you talk a little bit about the machine that you worked with or the machines? Um, I'd like to try and document this part of the process, did, did it come in from double deck? Where did the material come from before you, from the cake room? It was spun in double deck, then it went to cake wash, was washed, then brought into the coning room. But they had four cakes of this yarn on a rod, and the rods were on a huge uh, machine that they pushed on the floor then we would they would hang the rod up it would be four on a rack and we would uh, roll up a paper and put in this cake of yarn and we had to thread it up through the machine and then there was a cone that you had to put on the machine and then it would uh, so it came from a big spool onto smaller... It came from a cake of yarn onto a spool. And how many cakes would get onto one spool, or how many spools were from one cake were there? The machine was set that it would stop when the cone got as large as it was supposed to be. They had different weight cones that the customer wanted and the mechanics would set the machine that when it got that big it would stop and then you took it off. I think Ruby said you made 36 cones a day about or an hour. Could you talk about how many cones you made? Well you could make hundreds a day. Um, you had trays when you made one and took it off that you put it on and each tray held uh, six cones. And you had uh, a worker, it would be a man, that would come along and he would take up the trays when they would get big enough, or you got them full. How, about how many cones an hour, or approximately, what could you describe your production? Well, <laughs> I'll have to think. If you could do 600 or maybe 800 in eight hours, so in eight hours with 800. Now, I know that Aftex seemed, looking at it from the, the year 2001, Aftex really seemed unique because there were doctors and nurses on site and not only was the hospitalization covered, medicines were covered, and uh, they had their baseball team. It seemed like the social life and the other things extra besides just the work. Could you talk a little bit about what life was like at Aftex? What some of the what was your day like at the plant? It was very good. Um, the social part, really, I, living in um, Fort Valley, I didn't take part in any of the ball games, although I knew I was a good ball player when I went to school at Edinburgh. In fact, at Edinburgh, I was the star player because I got a gift for being the star player. But by living so far away, I couldn't take part in any of the social life after work, you know. It would have been too far for me to travel. Now, um, at the time that you were working in the coning room, you helped your mom support the children, and then you had a family of your own? Right. Could you talk a little bit about, a little more about your life? And well. I had a good life, I think, and uh, they would give you a maternity leave. You worked until you were five months pregnant, 
and then when the baby became four months old, you come back with all of your seniority and uh, started right in where you left off, your same job or whatever. How many children did you have while you were four? Three girls and one boy. Now, so you did you didn't really uh, participate then in the social life at Avtex. Uh, could you talk just a little bit more maybe about the health care that you got um, or some of the other information surrounding the plant? Well, they had a dispensary. If you were sick, you went there. And uh, at one time, you could get your medicine for a small amount of money and that's about all. I stayed healthy so I don't uh, remember using the dispensary or anything like that very often. They did carry insurance that uh, when you went to the hospital and all, well, you had very good insurance. Better in the beginning of the uh, plants than uh, toward the end. I'm sure there were a lot of events that happened. Uh, do you remember the day when the um, there was the fire in the stack and then the fire on the roof? Could you talk about some of the events that occurred uh, during your time there that, that you can remember? Well, I remember the fire because uh, um, we were off work a week or two. And I can't remember any of the other events. Well, a lot of times the lights would go off. And of course they had uh, other lights, town lights that they turned on. And sometimes we had to go home. But um, I don't remember anything that was real bad that I remember. Is there anything else that you can add, you'd like to add? I can't think of anything now. Did you meet your husband there? No. Mm. You, were, you spoke about your beginning pay. Do you remember <clears throat> some of the different time periods, uh, how the pay went, went up as time went on, for instance, do you remember any dates, uh, approximate years of the different pay scales? I can't remember the years, no. When you went uh, to, to piecework as part of your pay, do you remember what it was per piece? When you uh, got paid by the hundred, each one of these cakes had a cover on it and that's they would count ten in a bundle and that's how they counted how many you had done each day but it I don't remember uh, it was different kinds of yarn different pay for different kinds of yarn were you still working at the plant when it closed I had retired May the 1st, and it closed October the 31st, if I'm correct on that. How did you feel when the plant closed? Well, I thought that it was wrong to close it. That's my opinion. And uh, I didn't uh, really have a way to get to work. And I didn't want to drive alone is why I retired when I did. I feel that I could still do the job if it was still going, because it was easy. What would you like to see happen there at Avtex now in the future? Well, I think they're talking about making a park, aren't they? That would be nice. Now, you've lived through a lot of different things um, during the 20th century, and now that we're into the 21st century, 
could you make any statements or comments about your life and times in the 20th century? Oh, I don't know. How, did you, well, for instance, uh, at the historical committee yesterday, they said, well, you know, there weren't any deer here when the plant was built. The deer didn't start coming into Front Royal until the 1950s. Is there uh, anything that you can think of that's really different today that maybe things have changed? Well, deer came where, uh, into Fort Valley before 1950. So deer, I knew about the deer long before. Did you say 1950? Oh no, they came in Fort Valley long before that. Did, when you were growing up, uh, was your family a farming family? Yes. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about how people went from depending on the farming to having to get money to live? Well, you farmed and you canned and you preserved your vegetables and that's what you lived on. And uh, like I say, we could work maybe for 10 cents a day or something and you could buy uh, quite a bit if you saved that and there was no electricity in Fort Valley at that time we were using kerosene lamps after I got my job at Aft uh, wasn't Avtex then American Viscose I had the house wired and uh, American Viscose and FMC and Avtex have surely done a lot for lots and lots of people, including people in uh, Warren County, Shenandoah County, Page, Frederick, and even further. So, can you think of any questions that you'd like to ask your mom? I'm not very good today. <laughs> yes, you are. Well, we can. I'll, I'll leave my card. I can come back if you think of anything else you want to add to your tape. I'll bring it back and we can add it. I'll do that. Um, now, what was the, the pace of life today seems really fast. People have a lot more, a lot of meetings, a lot of running around in your car. Could you talk a little bit about the pace of life? Did, have you noticed a shift in uh, what people seem to be doing with their time? Quite a bit. Quite a bit. I uh, don't know that I would want to uh, raise my children the way that things are going now. I'm so glad that it was different when I raised my children. Sandra there, she could do anything when she was 9, 10, 11, or 12. And as you can see, she still can. <laughs> very, very. I had four children that worked very, very hard and helped me. Or I couldn't have been the worker that I was. Or worked as long as I did. So. Yeah, kids' lives are different today now. Very different. Very different. And I'm thankful that mine done really good. Could you, could you elaborate a little bit on, on what some of the differences are uh, that you've noticed in either kids today or uh, the way our lives are? I don't know what to say. Can you help? <laughs> well, did, for instance, the kids seem to work harder in the past. They did. They had to help with the work, and now they, they get what they want without working for it, and uh, it's not good. Okay, before I turn it off, or unless you need a break, can you think of anything else that, that you'd like to add? Any thoughts or feelings that, that you'd like to add uh, to preserve for the future? Well, I know I'm very glad to have had the plant to open because there are many, many homes that were built by people that work there 
and it helped me along for myself, my mother, and my younger brothers and sisters, and it helped me to give my children a better life. And that was my goal in life, to make sure that they had a better life than I had. Although I had a happy life growing up, even though I was very poor, but we were happy. And I think that means more than money or anything else. But you do need money to live. So I'm very happy to have had my job because my children all did well. And two of my girls, they didn't want to go to college. But my youngest girl did. And now she's doing very well. She teaches at the University of Michigan. And she's also a top social worker at St. Joseph's Mercy Hospital in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. So I'm very pleased. So I don't know anything else to say. Could I, I just, do you mind if I ask you a couple more sure, questions? Sure, go ahead. I have five uh, great-grandchildren and four grandchildren that is very good part of my life too. How did you come to be in Fort Valley? I was born in Fort Valley. I was born in the house that I'm living in now. And uh, your family before you, what was your maiden name? Did your family come here? Um, when did your family first arrive? My mother was born in Fort Valley. She was a munch. They were school teachers and things like that. And my father came to Fort Valley to work in the mines. And he met my mother in church there. And they ran off and got married. So that's how I got in Fort Valley. <laughs> um, a lot of people complained about Aftex being stinky. And people now are really scared. There's a, like a protest coming on Saturday. They're really afraid of uh, the pollutants. Did, did you worry about pollution? Do you feel that, do you want to say anything? I uh, know that there was quite a stink sometimes, but I have never thought that it harmed anybody myself. I don't feel that it did. Life in the times. Uh, I could tell about uh, the time uh, it's on now. It's okay. I, I can turn it back off if you want. Okay, I got it. Okay, then when you're ready, just tell me. And I'll All right. turn it back on. Tell me when to start whenever you're ready. My dad, Kemper Clay Powell, came from Lynchburg to the Fort Valley to work in the manganese mines. And those men would uh, come into uh, the little valley to attend the churches. And my mother was Zola Eugenia Munch. She would go to the church too. And that's where they met. And they had never been alone together at all, but they would talk there in church. And after the church service was over, they would talk outside. So they decided that they would run off and get married she was only 17 years old, so they ran off to Hagerstown and got married in October of 1917. And their first little boy was born in September the 13th, 1918. And her father got mad because she ran off and got married and there for about a year he didn't want to have anything to do with her. But soon as this little baby boy was born, why, he wanted to see it. And uh, he held it and he really liked it. He said, oh, said it's such a cute little booger. So from that day on to this day, that boy is 83 years old and uh, he still goes by the nickname of Booger. Now, they were, um, 
they went to the fair at your aunt? Well, the way my mother got away that she could run off, she and her best friend were going to Woodstock to spend the night with an older aunt that ran a boarding house there, and she lived near the fairgrounds. So my mother and daddy had decided that he would go to Woodstock that morning real early. They would get on the train and run off to Eggerstown. Well, when her best, she got up real early, and when her best friend woke up that morning, and my mother was gone, but she was in Hagerstown getting married, but they had nine children. We had the misfortune of my 11-year-old brother getting killed. He fell from the back of a truck when he was 11 years old. And other than that, the rest of the family lived real good lives and to be at least in their 60s and 70s before they passed away. Do you want to talk about when the pitchfork was in the I don't mean I'll tell that. <laughs> Unless I would say, say that when I was just a young girl and as a teenager I jumped down out of the barn one day and I ran a pitchfork way back in my ankles, in front of my foot near my ankle. And back then, you didn't get to go to the doctor. And I laid paralyzed from my waist down for two weeks that I couldn't move. My dad had to carry me to the table and to the bed. And in about two weeks, I got so I could hop on one leg had no crutches or anything, too poor to buy them. And there was a revival going on at a church there in the fort, about 10 miles away from my home. And there was a man, Ray Clem, would take a load of us children to the revivals. And they helped me, I hopped, they helped me get up on the back of that truck. And I went to church every night and I think that that was one of the things that helped to heal me, the good Lord. And my daughter, my granddaughter, wrote a story on that for school and she got an A on it. She couldn't understand why I could get well after being paralyzed for two weeks and then work as hard as I worked at Aptex. It never bothered me. After several years, I was just as though it had never happened. So maybe I better stop now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I missed that. Just tell me when to go. Whenever you're ready. Um, my father got really, really sick, and he would try to go to work. Back then, the only work he had was on a farm for a dollar a day. And some farmers would give him their cracked eggs for a day's work. But he would start to work and he could not make it. He would have to try to get back home. But then he was getting this uh, minor's tuberculosis. So there was no hospitals anywhere around close except in, up at Harrisonburg. So they took him up there and kept him a couple days and they sent him home to die with uh, minor's tuberculosis. So he died leaving all those children, and the youngest was just two years old, and there was no social services, no help at all, so we made it the best we could. I think we done very well. And that's why I think Abtex really, really played a part. Because after I had my job, I paid my father's burying expenses and bought a tombstone and so many things like that. So that's why I can't say a bad word about Abtex, FMC or American Viscose. So if it's anything bad going to be said about it, or the uh, bosses, foremans, they will have to go to somebody else. It gave me a good life, and I thank God every day for it. I have four 
very, very nice children. Thank God they all go to church. And when I left for work, I didn't have to say, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. They knew what to do, and they done it without any trouble. And Sandra can tell you that. And since she's been married, she has written me. She has told me so many times how she thanked me for teaching her all the things that I did. And she can tell you today. I think her on time. I retired when I was 67 years old, and I really hated to retire because my bosses and supervisors were very, very kind and good to me. When my daughter got her degrees in Indiana, they let me change my vacation so I could take a week and go out there. And then later, in a couple years, she got two degrees from the uh, University of Michigan. Well, they let me trade my vacation or change it so I could make a trip out there. If one of my children were sick and I was uh, had to work, they would let me take one of my break days and change my work day so that I could take them to appointments and things like that. So it was just like a family there to me, and I loved every minute of it. When the conning room first started, the girls had to wear blue uniforms and wear hair nets and hose. As time went on and girls had money to buy the latest fashions and styles, they did not want to wear the uniforms. Finally, they were allowed to do away with uniforms, hair, nets, and hose. One day, one of the young girls came in wearing short shorts. Mr. Claude Cara was the boss and he sent her home and told her to put on more clothes and come back. So <laughs> now <clears throat> I remember when we had the fire at the plant and I draw t drew two unemployment checks for the two weeks I was off. I got six dollars per week. That sounds unbelievable now. Times and pay scales have changed quite a bit since then. What in the world could you buy for six dollars go on for a week now? My husband Lester Licklider got a job at the plant after he got out of the army. The fuses bothered his asthma as he had asthma very bad and he had to quit his job. He did some mechanic work and helped people who were building houses and other carpenter work. He also helped a lot at home with her children. He was a good cook too, but he died in 1988 at the Veterans Hospital in Martinsburg. I have four grandchildren. The oldest grandson is Richard Eastep. He was valedictorian of his class in Mount Jackson when he graduated. He and he also his wife are veterinarians now. They practice in Maryland. And my two granddaughters, Sherry, Estep Heishman and Kim Campbell Atwood are both school teachers. My youngest grandson is just three and a half years old, and my granddaughter Kim Campbell Atwood was Miss Warren County in 1988. <coughs> my oldest daughter Gloria was Miss Edinburgh when she was 15 years old. My daughter Sandra was second runner up, a first runner up the, sec the next year. Not only did I work hard at Avtex, but as I said before, there wasn't any electricity in Fort Valley until around 1943. So I carried water from a well, scrubbed clothes on a washboard, built fire in a stove to cook my meals and for heat in the winter. We used kerosene lamps and an outhouse too. Kerosene was 15 cent per gallon. Milk was 16 cent per gallon. <clears throat> 
I have fi five great grandchildren Alan, Adam, and Aaron Heishman, Ashley, and Alex Atwood, ranging in the ages from four to 15 years old. Talking about how t things have changed, I never had a car until I had worked a few years at the plant. Now children can own their own cars and get their permits 15 to 16 years old. That's great if they do what's right. When I first started to work, you could get your lunch in the cafeteria. Soup was 10 cent, hamburger was 10 cent, and you could get a drink for 5 cent. After a while, things were changing and they started serving a better variety of food and prices kept going up. I have also have several certificates for perfect attendance at the plant. After going to twisting department when Coning Room closed in 1980, I was on time work and I didn't make near as much money, but I still gave them a good, good day's work. Again, I will say my life was better by working at Avtex. Avtex helped me and many others too. So it wasn't all bad as some people would like to say. Where there's a will, there's a way. I try to look at the good side of things and not dwell on the past. And Sandy Flynn, I want to thank you for being so kind and understanding while giving me this interview. You are a very nice lady. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Now, um, if you have any questions, <laughs> that's fine. Um, I spoke with Thelma Tui. <laughs> She's a great lady. She said she couldn't keep up with you. She <laughs> thought you had 40 machines at one time and she was still trying to get her 26 machines threaded. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd be off and running. Do you remember? She uh, she couldn't remember the exact number. Do you remember the number of machines when you went to piecework? I don't remember because you would have a different number depended on the kind of yarn you ran. If there was a heavy yarn, a heavier yarn, it would run off faster than the fine yarn would take longer to run. And, but I can't remember the machines now that I run, but I run just as many as I could. <laughs> Whether I was on piecework or time work. I had a sister, Sylvia Limley, that worked in twisting too, and she was a very fast, good worker. But Thelma, her husband, um, was really nice people. In fact, we had a lot of nice people there. Well, let's see. Um, it's on now, isn't it? Yes. Being 79, uh, you lived here before the times of electricity, before Avtex. Uh, could you share a little bit of, with us about how how you managed uh, with the clothing and um, without the refrigerator, without electricity. Uh, what was your day-to-day -day work like that you had to perform to uh, have all the things on the food on the table and clean clothing? Well, um, <clears throat> Everyone had to chip in and help with the garden work. And when my mother washed clothes, we had we filled an old big iron pot or kettle and we heated the water outside. She built a fire under this kettle. And uh, we always had hogs that we butchered in the winter time. So we had ham, sausage, pudding, and uh, all the hog meat. And for breakfast, why well, she would get up and build a fire in the range. Even in the summertime, you know, that was very hot. And she always made biscuits for breakfast. Biscuits, maybe fried ham, and sometimes fried potatoes and gravy. That was a great country breakfast. 
and uh, all of the children would uh, help with the work and we would can what we raised in the garden and uh, the year that I went to school in Edinburgh she made all of my clothes and uh, I uh, had one pair of shoes and they were getting holes in the bottom so I carried a piece of pasteboard in my book and at dinner time I could put pasteboard in the bottom so that my foot wouldn't hit the ground and I carried a piece of pasteboard in my book and at dinner time I changed that pasteboard because it was wearing my foot was getting on the ground so I mean I, I don't I'm happy about it I'm happy that I stayed well and uh, that I had a good life. I have no regrets. But then after I grew up and got my job, things got better for me. You mentioned that you, um, you carried the water in and um, so I guess you lived by the stream. Well, we had a, a well and then with a pump you pumped it and we also had a spring and then uh, we had a wooden ice box that the ice man came once a week and brought us a hundred pounds of ice and that's how we kept the um, milk and things cool and now those ice boxes I see them sold at sales they go way up into the hundreds of dollars so it's quite a change. Do you think, seeing both sides, are people any happier today because they have electricity and running water and a wash machine? I don't think they're as happy. They don't appear to be as happy as I can remember the people back then. Even with all that work, we still had time to visit and enjoy ourselves. And now you don't even have time to say hello to your neighbor, and it's not very good. Um, uh, okay, the electricity, the running water. Um, yeah, it's recording. You mentioned that you, uh, someone gave your family uh, about a battery-powered radio. Okay. Uh, we didn't have electricity, and during the war, someone had given my mother a battery radio because she had two sons in the Second World War. In fact, the oldest son was at Pearl Harbor when Pearl Harbor was attacked and it went on a couple weeks before she could hear whether he was living or dead. He was on the USS Pennsylvania and it was uh, damaged real bad but he only got a, a burn on the back of his neck. Of course they had, he said he had to swim quite a bit to save his life and finally she heard that he was alive where now today if it happens today instantly you hear about it and I can remember her sitting by that battery radio up into the night trying to see if she could hear anything on what was going on or if they would talk about the USS Pennsylvania it was very sad and then my other brother Herbert he was fighting in the war too. He has three battle stars. Uh, the Battle of the Rhine or, and the Battle of the Bulge. But I can't recall the third battle. And you wouldn't get a letter maybe in a couple months at a time. And uh, it just shows how things have changed. now. Okay, I'm Janet Eastep and I live in Strasburg. I went to work at the plant January 
of 44, 1944. When I was hard, you went in and uh, started tying knots. That was about the first thing we had to learn to do. And because they had to be a quarter of an inch long. If they was longer, we was told about it and we had to fix them. So uh, we did that a couple days and then we went right to piecework, although we had to be trained for so many weeks. And it was uh, hard at first, but you kind of caught on. And then uh, we got a certain amount of spindles. We started out with the lowest amount, which was 23, and I think it went up to 36 and maybe at some time a little higher, but that was when the yarn was running good. So you started out with 23 spindles, and uh, if you made your average for so many days or weeks, then you went up to 25, then 28, 31, 33, and 36. If you did not make that average, your spindles was taken away from you. I said we started to work at 7 o'clock in the morning. Everybody was there ready to push the button when the time came, when the horn blew. So we started to work and we had a rest period and then we had lunch. A half an hour lunch, in fact. So that didn't give us a whole lot of time for the cafeteria, which we had a nice cafeteria at first, and then uh, to the restroom, of course, and back to our spindles. So then, uh, that was called piecework. After we got our average, we went on piecework. I said we had to be so careful, as, as I said before, about the knots. We had to be careful about our safety, and uh, we had to be extra careful about our waste. They did not allow but so much waste for so many covers. Because we, we counted our covers. That was the cake that was wrapped with a cover and we spun it on a spool. Uh, well, it wasn't really a spool, they called it a cone. And we put it on that and that was checked by checkers a lot of times. Checkers came around and counted our covers. We bundled them up in a bundle of 10. And we'd get over, if we had a high number of spindles, we could get over 300. So it wasn't, but you stayed at your spindles and you worked. You didn't loaf. <laughs> that wasn't allowed. And uh, so uh, they had, uh, most of us was on piecework, but they did have some time work. They had cold cakes on, on piecework, short cakes on piecework, but time work had bad cakes packing, counting covers, and recon. They was on time work. They would get time work by seniority. And it was uh, a very nice department to work in. The Coney Room, I would say, was one of the best. We had a beautiful hardwood floor, which they kept clean at all times, shiny. And I said we had no odor, and everything was nice. When we got through working in the evening, we had to clean our machines every evening for the next girl that came in when we was on shift work. We started on daylight, but then we went to shift work as they picked up production. On shift work, we had an A shift and a B shift for a long time. If we cut down on production, we would go back to daylight. But then at one time, and it was in July, of 71, I think that is, July the 5th of 1971, we had an A shift, B shift, and an F shift. F shift had 75, B shift 83, and no, A shift, I'm sorry, A shift had 75, B shift had 83, and F shift had 33. That was 191 girls at one time working the coning room. So I said that was the highest, to my knowledge, that we ever had. In 1971. 1971. And I said after that then, if uh, production was cut, well, of course, they laid off girls. We had to share time because we did have a union, and it went by seniority. So we had to lay off girls. They would uh, 
we would have to share time for six weeks first. And after six weeks, then they would be laid off. They would be noticed their name, put their name on the bulletin board. And of course, everybody would keep an eye on that. And when it was shared time, it was placed on the bulletin board. And they went by seniority to share time. But they started at the bottom and go to the top. Because what they didn't share this week would share the next week. How did you share the time? We took, uh, well, we'd get the day off. See, you, if you, uh, if your name was on the bulletin board, there would be a certain day of the week that you would be off. So you share, you shared a day a week. You could share as much as a day a week. If you had to share two days, I think they would lay off some till you got down to one day a week. That was sort of the rules. But the boys did the same as the girls. The boys hung the yarn for us in the coning room. We didn't have a whole lot of boys, but they worked hard. They had to hang the cakes that we run on, on the cones. So uh, they hung uh, four cakes. Let's see, it was, it was four, eight rods with four on a rod to our machines, and they hung all day long. So as long as we worked, if we stopped early, they could stop a little early, but if we didn't, they had to fill up everybody else's and keep them going. Uh, we had, uh, and she had our waste. When you go back and talk about the waste, I said we was allowed so much because a boy come around in the evening and waited. And then we had what covers we had over that the cover checker didn't count our covers. We had to put our covers and our waste in a cloth bag with a drawstring, put it in a box that we call cover box. The next morning, or the next shift, would come in and count those covers and weigh that waste and it would be put on our production card, which we had at our spindles at all time. But they would put it on, bring it back to our spindle and for the next day. So they, it was very hard at times but easy and it was very nice because it was good surroundings to work and the girls were very nice. We had a very nice supervisor, I have to tell you that. Mary Jane Catlett was one of the best supervisors we had but we really liked her. She's still living. She's, uh, I talked to her just the other day. So we had her and Mary Stryker. Uh, she was good. Merle Stryker was her name. We had her and uh, so it was a nice place to work. And we still, uh, a, a girl, Lucy Foster, and I sort of started after we were laid off. We decided to meet one day a, week, a month, the third Wednesday of the month, we'd meet somewhere and eat and have lunch. To this day, we do that. But we've had a crowd, now we have 10, 12, sometimes 15. And anyone that wanted to come is welcome to come. Anybody worked in the department. And we've had a very nice time. And we'll do that this coming fourth, oh, oh, third Wednesday of this month. We go to different places. We go to Winchester, we go to Front Raw, and we go up towards Woodstock and Ramada Inn. We've even been, and we will be this week, that the next week, at the truck stop in Tom's Brook. So we kind of catch them all. But it's a real nice time and remembering time. That is neat. So uh, I don't know if there's anything else that I can tell you about. That. Uh, well, how many years were you actually at Avtex? I, I worked at Avtex for 39 years and f five months. And were all of the years in the coning? All the year. Well, until they closed the coning room. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about? Uh, where you were in the factory? Oh, I worked in the converting department, which we called the coning room all the time. And it was next to the cafeteria. In fact, if you knew where that was, it was right next to the cafeteria. So at lunchtime, we didn't have far to go. We could get out, get to the cafeteria in a hurry. In fact, that helped us a lot. But I worked there that long and enjoyed every minute of it. I never did have a too bad of days. <laughs> so, about how many years were you at Coning before they bumped you? Well, um, see, I went to work in '44, as I said, and we retired in '83. So I guess what 
I was it was two years I believe back there. It must have been about eighty one, I guess, that we moved I went back to the twisting because they closed down the Coney Room. The converting Coney Room was closed. Which was a sad part. How did they close the coating and still have the twisting? Well, that comes from the yarn that they used back there was up twist yarn, which was coming directly from the double deck. And our yarn didn't come from the double deck, really. It was a different kind of yarn. They just got rid of our yarn for the rayon that we was running. So they didn't even produce that anymore? No, that was stopped. To my knowledge, it was anyway. Because the other yarn was entirely different. It was much heavier yarn. And then sometimes, though, at one time we spun yarn back in there, back in the up twist or back in the twisting department, the yarn that they put in the, uh, the astronauts put in that it was far proof. What was that material? Oh, it was touchy. It was real, real fine, just as fine as it could be. Almost hair fine. You know, it's much finer than anything we'd worked with before. But you got it done. I said it, it was, he was. If you didn't know how to do it, you was trained to do it. Because when we moved from the coning room back to the twisting and up twist, we was trained to do that job. So that made it easy for us. We've gotten a lot of information um, so far about uh, the insurance, uh, the insurance and the health benefits. Um, could you make a comment about how the how it struck you uh, the, those French benefits that came along with the work there? Well, to be honest with you, I never had to use any of it. I had two maternity leaves. Other than that, I don't reckon I, re I doubt that I ever used insurance. Do you think? I don't remember. I w we've been very lucky in our lifetime. I said up until the last two years, we didn't take medicine of any kind or pills of any kind. So I didn't use it, but it was there for those who needed it, as far as I know. But uh, you said the insurance and the, but as far as insurance, we did, they did carry insurance policy on us over there, but then of course that was dropped too. Everything was dropped when, so it was gone. When you first came to work at Avtex, um, were you looking for a job? Did did your family have farm work going on? What, no. what would your Could you talk a little bit about if Avtex hadn't been there, what your options would have been, or uh, your thoughts and feelings about Avtex being there? Well, when uh, I got out of high school, my mother had passed away when I was a senior in high school. But we managed to get through it all. And when I graduated in 43, went to work over there in 44, there wasn't any question. There was no other places to go. I did, we didn't have money to go to college or anything like that. So we went to Avtex, which, uh, like I said, our family all together put in 239 years and 10 months, my immediate family. So I, my sister was working over there at the time, Hilda Neff, and she was working at the Coney Room Course, so I thought that was good, I'd go there too. So that's, that's how I got there. And then my brother, I think I went in January, he went in February, and he was in the acid reclaim, I think, the whole time he was there. And he put in 40 more years for it. Where, my paper, did I hand you that? Paper? Yeah, yeah, he put in, he worked a year longer than we did. My brother, he, he worked 40 years and five months. He went to work on July the 5th, 44, February 5th, 44, and, and retired July the 1st of 84. Do you mind saying their names? And then my sister Hilda Neff worked there 33 years from 1941 to 82. She was off eight years on her maternity leave. She had three children. Her husband Roy Neff worked there three months. Then I went there, I worked 39 years, five months, went to work January the 7th of 44 till May 31st of 1983. My husband Carol Eastep 
Worked there 37 years and seven months, October 22nd, 1945 to May 31st, 1983. My sister Louise Crunk Hausenfluck went to work August the 10th, 1948 till November 1989. She worked 41 years and three months because she stayed till it closed. Her husband Kenneth Hausenfluck had worked there 18 years, but then he he uh, kind of, he quit. When sometimes they laid off, you know, and they'd find another job. He went into the meat cutting. He was trained to be a meat cutter. My sister Geneva Crump McWilliams worked there 23 years, January 8, 1968. She went there, and I don't really know the year she quit. So that was 235 years and 10 months of work in my family. That's amazing. Uh, your brother, who you spoke of first, did you mention his name? Yeah, Ralph Crump, 40 years and five months, February 5th, 1944, until July 1st, 1984. 19, 90, 90, oh, that's right, 19. 84. That's right. He, he, yeah, I was thinking about 200, 2001 now. <laughs> yes. And how did you spell the last name? Which one? Us? Kronk? K R O N K. It's not very familiar to people because it's not too many of us in the phone book. If they are, they're almost all related. That's amazing. Was that a record of family service at the plant? Well, they seem to think it is. I, I, I couldn't say for sure myself, but. Uh, a lot of people that I've spoken to and people that asked me about it uh, had me together up the, the dates and all. Well, thanks that it is, but I wouldn't like to say that it is. Do you think that um, a lot of people had children and they sent them to college uh, because they worked at Avtex and they sent their children to college? Uh, you mentioned that you. Um, that you didn't have the money to go to college, so you went to Avtex. Do you feel that if you had had the money, you might have gone to college? Well, I, I don't know, because when you know, you don't have a chance of going. My daddy worked in the lime kill. And it was, uh, I have three brothers and three sisters, it was seven of us. So we knew it wasn't a chance, it wasn't any use to think about any place else. I wouldn't have minded being a nurse or something of that sort. but. I knew it couldn't come about at that time, so it wasn't a, it just wasn't any thing to think about. Did and I really don't, to tell you the truth, don't know too many immediate workers that I worked with that the children went to college, or we, we, we talked about it anyway. I just couldn't sit here and tell you those. Now their grandchildren, yes. My grandchildren, yes. But not my children didn't go. So that's, that's just the way it works. My husband was in the Second World War. He was in there about three and a half years. Like, like that, three and a half years. And he came home in... Dark August. You, it, and we got married in August. He came home the 1st of August. We was married the 25th of August. So we've been together all 56 years now. Turn this off for a minute. Here with, uh, could you say now, your names? Sir? I would like to introduce my husband now. This is Carol E. Stepp that worked at the plant for, for uh, 37 years, seven months right. in the Visco, Visco's department. And he, uh, drove a fork truck most all the time and dumped crumbs. That was mainly his job, and that's what he was doing the day we, we retired the same day. Could you talk a little bit about what brought you to Avtex and what your work was like, what, what you felt about the work? Well, when he got home from the service down that. Oh, well, I went to work over in the Visco department. And I worked around, and I finally learned the job on crumb dump. And well, it wasn't. When I first went there, it wasn't uh, dumping crumbs with fork trucks. They kind of spade them out by hand. 
and uh, then it wasn't too long till they start dumping uh, pork trucks. And then I'd start dumping them for pork truck. Oh, I guess I dumped them for about 25 years, I reckon. Where did you dump them? Could you talk? Number, number two unit. Down in a... They uh, yep. dump down in a hole, go down in a hole in, into a big churn. They hold three cans. And they were like big barrels, yeah, right? Yeah, big, big, big drums. I big barrels, I call them. And the, the drums were the, the crumbs? The crumbs was in. And the cellulose, the beginning yeah. of the process? Yeah, they would, uh, well, they come off the, uh, out of the soda room in the big uh, flighters and they was all ground up and then dumped in these big cans and they was packed in there. They packed them in there and then they was aged in the merchandise cellar for oh baby but I don't know how long just so many hours and then they was set up to the fifth floor where I dumped them in the merchandise or to the uh, churn floor. And I might say I had the privilege of working down there. <coughs> I had the privilege of working down there two weeks, was it? No, it wasn't quite two weeks, no. was it? When I was laid off because the Conian room went down, I had I was forced to go down to the Wiscos and take the man's job. Which or I would have to be fired. I'd be you know, lose everything. But then that's when the union stepped in a little bit and they said they couldn't do that. So I only had to work down there well, about a week, I'm sure, it was, but it was, they was on four shifts then. So we worked together that, that long down there. And then they said I could come back and be on furlough until another job opened up and then I come back. Mm -hmm. That's when you went down to what, twisting? Yes. So anyway, that's, uh, you said you drove fork truck yeah. 25 years. You was over there. Well, I dumped the crumb about 25 yeah. years, but I worked in merchandise cellar too, where the store them. Could you talk a little bit about what what happened to the crumbs after you dumped them? Well, that's where they made their viscose. Now, how, uh, how they did it? Now I just don't know. Don't know how they did it. They had water and soda and all kinds of crumple to make it in liquid. So you dumped them into a big hole? Yeah, I dumped them in these big churns. And after you f finished dumping the crumbs for 25 years, where did you work in the plant after that? Well, I worked in stay, I stayed in different, uh, I stayed in the Visco apartment, but I had different jobs. I mostly stayed, I worked in the merchandise cellar where they aged the uh, the crumbs, and that would send them upstairs to the fifth floor, and take them off the flighters, and, and put them in the merchandise cellar to age. When you came back from the war, did uh, were you recruited? Could you talk a little bit about how where your service took you? If you well, I was, share that? he was in the infantry, so he in didn't have it easy. I was in the 85th Infantry Division, and we was in Italy. And day Rome fell, I was one of them, one of them marched through Rome. And then we went on up through, what was that next city? Florence, wasn't it? Florence, Florence Italy. Florence, Italy. We went on up through there. And then, I think it wasn't too long after that the war, Japan, uh, Germany laid arms down. We was up, I was up in the, what to call the Alps when the war, the Germans surrendered. Then that then, wasn't the end of it. Well, then I uh, was put on a plane. They broke up, they broke up by the 85th Infantry Division, and I went over in the 88th. And for debate for what, about two months, wasn't it? Three months? Something like that. Then uh, I was sent back home. 
I was on the way home in the airplane when I got word to uh, Japan surrender. Because he was on his way there. I was on the way home for 30 days and then go back and take some training and then go to Japan. But that all broke up then in Japan. So I didn't have to go over there. Then he come home and we got married. We got married but yeah. <laughs> Did the Army uh, advise you to go into the Avtex? No. No. He went there because that's where I was working yeah, and he come home I was working there then. Just what I just wasn't any other places around here to, were, to were, go to work. Were both of you from farming families before the Avtex came about? We, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. We didn't have a farm really. We didn't have a farm. We had we chickens and a cow and that was about it. Then hogs. We did have that. But then that's what we ate, was pork, you know, and chicken. So I said, and we had to have a cow, so when the babies come along, they had milk, I guess, because we always had a cow. I don't know about him. Well, about the same thing. Huh? But he did yeah. live on farms. Yeah, I did live down here on a farm down below town here. Then I went to work up here at the silk mill. And then. That was before you went in service. Yeah, that was before I went in service. And then I went to work out here at Stone Coy for a while. And then it wasn't long that till I went to Fort Belvoir. Just to work? Just to work. And I worked in post uh, PX, they called it. And then that's when I went to service. He was called to service. Yeah. What do you think would have happened if Avtex hadn't been here? Did, did it seem to really... Uh, it perked up the towns. It really did, I think. And they kind of went down a little, I think, when they left. I was so surprised when I went to Front Royal last week that I didn't know what to do and walked up Main Street. I couldn't believe my eyes. That, but then the shopping centers comes in, you know, and kind of takes over. And it's sad in a way and good in a way, I guess, but I don't see much good in it, really. Well, same way with Winchester. Yes. Winchester was the same way. See, when mall come in, why well, there ain't nothing down down anymore. But it's building up more, I think, now. I think after a while, they'll get going. I said it's too many people, too many people and things to do. So, How does life seem different from the 1950s um, how does the year 2001 differ from being in the 1950s? How is life different now versus then? I believe everybody has everything too handy. I said you can't believe the way we lived then till the way they live now. I said what it would be now without TV or all these other things which I don't have, a computer and all that, I never have. <laughs> but uh, it just isn't the same. I don't think the family is a close because it's too many things to do and too many places to go and you got the means to go with. You can go. But I said of course families are close. I don't mean they're not but they're just not together as much I don't believe. But even when we went to school, the schools didn't have ball games and all this to go to, which we have enjoyed immensely. I said our grandchildren, all the girls, the two girls and a boy, I said, played volleyball, basketball, baseball, and soccer and all that stuff. And we didn't miss those games. We went to them. Now they're out of school. They're out of college. There's no games to go to unless we go to where we don't know any of the children hardly. But we certainly did miss it when they were all out through that. Do, do you notice anything different about life today? <laughs> Get pretty fast, I tell you. The years go fast. The years going fast. I just, I just came to really realize we've been retarded on. Um, we were retarded in 83. Now it is. Eight, 18 years we've been retarded. So that is a long time. Yes. But we're lucky. I said so many they're people when they out. retire, they don't live to enjoy it. And we have lived to enjoy it. And I said we are thankful for every day. 
What do you do with your time now that you've been retired? Well, you're busy. I, I help the sick on my street, we're really. Right see, we'd be right busy. We're keep, we keep and we the sick. take a lot of people to the doctors, but including my brother down here. And it's a lady down here on the street that's 87, will be 87, the 20th of this month, which has been a very good friend of mine. She worked at the plant when I worked there, so we have things to talk about. We've known each other for 50 years. She brags about it so that we've never had a, a you know, a, a fuss or got mad at each other or anything for 50 years. She'll tell everybody that. So we take care of that. My sister, my youngest sister, has cancer of the lungs and uh, it's uh, terminal of course so uh, I have plenty of things to do. Do you want to add anything else about um, before Avtex or about Avtex that you can think of? Well I don't know. I don't know what to say. I think it was sold so many times that you kind of got scared each time because you didn't know whether somebody was coming in by it, whether you'd have a job or not. You know, and that all made a difference because, like you say, there just wasn't a lot of jobs to get at that time. And uh, so we was just thankful for every day we had over there. What were your reactions when they decided to close the plant down? Well, it was sad. We had already gone, of course, you see. But we knew lots of people that were there yet. And I know it interrupted a lot of people's living. And it was a lot of worry for them, and I felt sorry for them, really. And your sister was still working at the My, plant? Yes, but she could retire. She was lucky enough to be able to retire at that time. And uh, that's the redhead there in that little... You, you met her over there at our meeting. She retired in. What would you like to see happen um, now that they're remediating the land? Do you have any uh, wishes that you, what you'd like to see? Well, there? they're talking so much about this museum. I think it would be wonderful if they would build them a little building and have a little museum just for that. I'm sure they could gather up enough things to that people would come and see it and generations to come would it be a lot of members of families that could come that didn't know what you might put in this museum and understand things that even we didn't understand from one department to the other because when you worked in one department you didn't know what was going on in the other departments people didn't understand that they thought if you worked there you knew everybody but if somebody worked in another department you didn't know them Twenty years from now, when um, school children and different people are visiting the museum, do you have any advice for the future? <laughs> I wouldn't know what. I hope it's uh, I hope it's a good future. That's all I can say. Because you, I tell you, you can't predict the future. I can't anyway. I wish it would be everything, love, and good things, but. Things don't look good sometimes, and sometimes it looks up, so we can only hope for the best for my children and everybody else's. Can you think of anything that you, you all would like to add? Anything at all? I don't know. It seems to me like we've talked a lot. <laughs> I wouldn't know what it would be. <laughs> all right.